Thanks for joining us uh, tonight for this celebration. Uh, this award is the uh, hallmark of the uh, ASH program and uh, represents to us a very meaningful moment each year as we uh, pay tribute to government innovators across the country in a very competitive process that begins with a thousand plus applicants and gets down to the uh, group that we have here tonight. Um, it uh, was the original purpose of the Ford Foundation when they started this and it remains our purpose to shine a bright light on really good effective public servants uh, overcome a little bit of the image that sometimes the public has about public service to, to show that every day very creative and effective activities are uh, undertaken by uh, those of us who are public servants. So thanks for joining us for this celebration of innovation and uh, creativity. Uh, since 1985, when this started, we've, uh, we've recognized over 400 awards, 400 government programs, presented about $20 million uh, in uh, prize money, and that money, as you all know, uh, goes for the purposes of causing other people in the country and around the world to understand the importance of your innovation and to replicate it. And that's the intention of the award itself. Six years ago, Roy Ash, uh, who served two presidents uh, establishing and then working in OMB, uh, also uh, made a substantial grant to this program uh, in tribute to the importance that the innovation and effective government have on the very footprint of democracy itself. And we appreciate uh, Roy Ash's participation as well. I'd like now to introduce to you the director of the Ash Institute, Tony Sage. Uh, Tony is a Daewoo Professor of International Affairs at Harvard's Kennedy School, uh, previously was in charge of the China and Asia programs for the Ford Foundation, uh, and uh, oversees a number of uh, this program and a number of other programs as well. Tony. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, first of all, let me also uh, welcome you here today. But secondly, I'd like to, on behalf of everybody, thank Steve and Cara, Chrissy, uh, Jason, Caitlin, Melissa, and all the staff at the Ash Institute who don't just work really hard in, in this one evening, but actually work very hard through the entire year from the process of generating applications uh, to come in, uh, working with the evaluators, working with you, uh, on the program. So I'd just like to thank them on behalf of everyone here for the tremendous amount of work they do and also people like Kate at the back there who helps with the promotion uh, with communications for a lot of these awards. So I'd like to just give them a, a round of applause. For uh, the Ash Institute is dedicated to fostering democratic government and innovation uh, not just in the U.S., but also worldwide. Uh, we have a number of sister programs in different countries around the world. And this Innovations in Government, uh, American Government Award Program, constitutes an important part of this endeavor through introducing best practices to public sector leaders that can make government more innovative and responsive to citizens' needs. As Steve uh, just mentioned in his uh, comments, to some extent, the origins of the program lie in the disillusionment with government that was prevalent in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And the intention when the program was launched was to puncture the myth that a government is simply a bureaucratic backwater populated by lackluster, unimaginative workers and managers. Uh, you all here uh, completely dispel as such myths through the work that you've done and the innovation you've shown in your work. In fact, some years back, our former dean uh, edited, a book, edited a book entitled Why People Don't Trust Government. And then with the support of the Ford Foundation, this program was born to counter that kind of perception and to highlight the, the difference that government does make in the lives of our citizens. And as I just said, all of you uh, here today are living proof of the simple but important truth that government does matter and that it can make an important difference in the lives of ordinary people. Uh, this evening, as finalists, you join an illustrious group of previous winners and finalists, and I want to thank you all on behalf of the Ash Institute for the tremendous work that you have done and obviously will continue uh, to do. Contemporary societies across the world, developed as well as developing ones, face urgent challenges regarding socioeconomic inequality, 
how to deal with immigration to integrate communities, uh, health care, human security and education, to name just a few. Whether and how they can meet these challenges depends upon the character and quality of democratic governance in these societies. It depends on how we can share learning across jurisdictions and borders about best practices. And I think this program helps us meet this objective by discovering and bringing public recognition to impressive and effective government initiatives. Now, you may not think of yourselves as data points, uh, but we do. And in fact, the kinds of innovations that you come up with are tremendously important to us uh, for our research work. Steve and other colleagues have benefited enormously from your experiments and have been able to think about core questions of how does innovation occur? And the important question of is innovation transferable? And if so, under what kinds of uh, circumstances? So it's vital to our work as we try and puzzle with those challenges of what makes for good innovation and how best practices <coughs> can be transferred. In fact, we're pleased to note uh, a survey from earlier this year that discovered that close to 80% of our past innovation winners had been replicated in other jurisdictions. And a number of those innovations have been replicated in well over 100 different sites. So again, I think this punctures the myth that uh, replication of best practices and innovations is a difficult thing uh, to achieve. So we have here today a good cross-section, both geographically and in terms of areas covered. Geographically, we range, range from Maine along the coast through Massachusetts, New York, Washington, D.C., and down to Florida, across to Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Idaho, Wisconsin, and California. The challenges uh, covered by you and your work range from healthcare, subject of no little importance uh, these days and no little interest, the improvement of service delivery uh, through new technologies, education, improving the quality of our workforces, water resource management, economic development. It's a truly wonderful array of innovations if you look through uh, not just uh, the finalists that are here today, but many incredible uh, programs that actually didn't make uh, the final list for one another. It's a truly tremendous uh, achievement and you deserve our thanks for that work. So your work is crucial and you're members of an inspirational group and I want to thank you finally for all your hard work, congratulate you for your achievements and wish you the best of success in your future endeavors. So thank you very much. Uh, Tony's a wonderful guy and he's my boss, but only a Harvard professor would call some of the best and brightest public service servants data points. <laughs> um, let me just say very quickly, uh, there are a number of folks in the room who helped as judges and other sources of expert advice. I'm not going to ask them to stand, but I'd just like to thank them. Uh, Mark Abramson from Leadership Inc., Jonathan Brule from IBM Center for the Business of Government, Cabell Cropper from the National Criminal Justice Association, Jenna Dorn from the National Academy of Public Administration, Amy Ellsbury from the National League of Cities, Harry Hertz from the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, Neil Johnson of the Pew Center on the States, uh, Pam Johnson of Governing Magazine, Tina Sung, Partnership for Public Service, Bill Mosier and Elizabeth Turner of Visionaries, and you met Tony Sage. We're uh, fortunate in this program to have some of the best, most committed associations, professional leadership help us with that, and we want to thank them for their help. I'd also like to pay, uh, uh, pay a special thanks to Patrick McCarthy, Senior VP of Annie Casey Foundation. Annie Casey's been a, a terrific um, partner of ours, and you'll, you'll hear from and, and see Patrick shortly when we present the award, but we want a special thanks to him. Finally, um, uh, two other folks I'd like to recognize. Uh, one is uh, Bill Klinger, former congressman from Pennsylvania, longtime uh, 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 expert on our panels here with his wife, Judy. Uh, Bill, could you stand so we can say thank you to you? And then I'd just like to uh, one other member of our uh, a panel uh, who uh, chaired it this year. I'd like to invite her up for comments. Uh, a longtime committed public servant, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, the Lieutenant Governor formerly of the uh, State of Maryland, adjunct professor at Georgetown, 
a uh, good friend of all of ours and the leader of the pro you, you can have great confidence in her judgment because she was a leader of the panel that chose you. So please help me welcome <laughs> Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. Thank you, Steve. And I want to thank Steve uh, for doing such an extraordinary job uh, recruiting, getting, making sure that throughout the country uh, people know about the program and that we're recruiting the best people to compete. And um, each year you just do a terrific job. And can we give him a round of applause? He's really great. He really is. And anybody who has worked with him knows he has a wonderful sense of humor. Some of times I appreciate it. <laughs> And thank you, Tony, for, for your good, good words. And it's great to be with you here, Bill and, and Judy. But um, uh, Steve asked me if I could come by, you know, I could come by. And I often don't get to come to this event. But today, I really wanted to um, for a number of reasons. One, I'm actually in Washington, so I only had to walk five blocks. <laughs> that was easy. But more importantly, um, this has been a very moving month for me and for members of my family. Um, and when we saw, uh, when my uncle, uh, Senator Kennedy, was put, you know, his body was at um, the John F. Kennedy Library, 50,000 people came um, and stood in line till 2 o'clock in the morning to say thank you. And I received hundreds and hundreds of letters telling me stories of what Ted Kennedy did to help him. And that replicates um, the experience in, in my life of people telling me what John Kennedy did or uh, my father, Robert Kennedy. And each taught us, I think, not just me as a member of the Kennedy family, but our whole country, uh, that politics was an honorable profession and that you can make a difference if you got involved and engaged in government. Uh, my father, I remember, would say that government uh, is the place that we make our most solemn, common decisions. It's the place where we take care of those left out and left behind. They're sick and our elderly, and it's where we educate our people. He understood how important government was. He loved making government work. Uh, when he was a, a senator, when they first passed the Edu Elementary and Secondary Education Act, he said, let's put results into that act. Let's see, actually, if our money is going to good purposes. He believed that when you have government, you want to make it effective. You want to help people. You want to make people trust that it works for you because it is the way that you build trust in one another. You don't fear one another. You trust one another. And today, uh, we have great challenges, as you know, in this country about what is the role of government. Um, we've seen these in August, these people who are not telling the truth. I hate to use that word that has become so famous in the last 24 hours. I just was wondering, do you pay attention to politics sometimes? And, and the fact is, um, we have to tell our story. Uh, I, I talked to one group here tonight who had a wonderful program. I love their program, and we talked afterwards. But sometimes we don't explain what we're doing as well as we can. And I guess if I was going to leave you one thought, um, it's that you're important. You're critical. You're critical not just because of the health care you provide or the education you provide or um, the fact that there's one group that figures out where the water goes, the evaporation group. I thought that was incredible. Um, but you're important beyond that because you're important most of all to say that government works, that what we do together makes our life better. And so some of you are going to be the prominent winners, but each of you are winners. And I think more than anything that you can do is you can go to Congress tomorrow or the next day. You can see your governors. You can be on television. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Share it. Show it. Shout it. We need to hear your stories because we need to believe in one another, and that's what you do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I'd like to next invite uh, a long-term 
a uh, friend of this program and of mine, uh, Ed DeSev, made comments. Ed, so I, I uh, won this award back in the dark ages, and I used to view innovation and the guys in charge of financial controls as natural enemies, right? So I could innovate if I didn't get caught by the guys that controlled all the rules. And so uh, uh, Ed DeSev is one of the few people who started on the financial side and still believes in innovation uh, as the uh, financial uh, CFO of the city of New York, uh, city of Philadelphia, as a uh, person who started a consulting company that now is preeminent in the country on uh, financial matters, uh, CFO of HUD, uh, deputy director of management at OMB, uh, and now finds himself in the interesting and fascinating place of uh, being uh, uh, a key official in charge of the Recovery Act money trying to manage the accountability restrictions on one side versus the innovation demands on the other. So we are delighted that Ed DeSev could spend some time with us, uh, special advisor to the President on the Recovery Act. Uh, Mr. DeSev, would you please share a little light on innovation for us? The thing you always have to remember when you deal with mayors is you only have to remember one word. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> for probably seven or eight years, I toured for the US Conference of Mayors, and I spoke at the Mayor's Leadership Institute. Um, Ed Koch, Diane Feinstein, among others, were people who kind of came and listened to the wisdom that I could purvey. And because I wasn't very good about names, of Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, that was really brilliant. Mayors are always brilliant. It's a thing we love. Um, uh, Tony, I love your talk. I really did. I enjoyed it. But Tony, we got to have more fun. We can't just be data points. We have to be dancing data points. We have to be magnificent data points. There needs to be a joie de vivre about all the things we do. We got to. Government people just want to have fun. Was that a song? <laughs> Is that a song? I think it was. And so I hope tonight we can have a little bit of fun as we talk about innovation. Now I've written a very long speech. Steve, speech. Oops, sorry about that. Speech. Oh, good. 12 words. <laughs> now why did I write only 12 words? Because I just realized yesterday, thank you, Kara, that I was the principal speaker tonight. <laughs> True story, true story. And so I only had time for 12 words. And so I'm gonna kinda go through those and, 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 and just kinda talk to you a little bit about it and ask you, I mean, having Bill Klinger here. Bill Klinger looks fabulous. Does he look fabulous? He looks fabulous. I don't know who the girl with it is, but if his wife finds out, we're all in trouble. Bill and I are both from Pennsylvania. And over the years, he kind of, well, the Klinger Cohen Act. I mean, you know, what more does anybody have to say? They don't remember that anymore, Bill. They forgot. <clears throat> the Klinger Cohen Act was an act that implemented innovation, information technology in the federal government. And we, of course, at OMB had to make it into a graphic. There had to be this graphic design of the Klinger Cohen Act. And we wrote it, we had these beautiful PowerPoint slides. And we talked about the Klinger Cohen life cycle, except we called it the Klinger Cohen lifestyle. <laughs> we, we made a small mistake in one of the words. And you know, we, we tease, we could joke it, we could laugh. <laughs> Thank you. God, if somebody really understands this kind of humor, that we, we could talk about that sort of thing, we, we can joke about that. But the kind of standard that that has set for the federal government since 19 for a really long time is amazing. The fact that you can, with a piece of legislation like that, make a really big difference in what goes on. It was innovation through standard setting, which is one of the kinds of innovation we all know about, especially if you're at OMB when that's all we do is set standards. I mean, a little coffee will set a standard or two. A little coffee will set out some benchmarks. <laughs> benchmarks. Twelve words. Twelve words. First word is drivers. Drivers. See, I'm in the implementation business. They don't let me at the White House do policy. 
This is not, no policy. They have no policy. No policy. But they realized after they decided they were going to have the uh, Recovery Act that they needed somebody to implement it. So, of course, you all watched on TV as the president turned to the vice president and said, and nobody messes with Joe. Remember that? We all said that in June. Nobody messes with Joe. The next day, I got a call from Joe. And... Uh, Joe said, Ed, would you, actually his, his chief of staff, Ron Klain, said, would you come down and talk to the vice president? I said, no, no, I, I'm very happy where I am. A professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League, you know, the whole deal. I, it's very happy. Ron, Ron said, no, no, Ed, you don't understand. Would you please come and talk with the vice president? I said, no, I don't think so. I, Ron raised his voice slightly. Ron is not a forceful person in that sense. I, I don't mean, Ron is a fabulous guy. If you don't, if anybody ever gets a chance to meet Ron Klein, you need to meet him. He's a, a, a terrific guy. He then said, no, Ed, would you please come down and meet with the vice president? I said, okay. <laughs> so I showed up and uh, sat down in the vice president's office. And the vice president was not happy. I shouldn't tell this story, should I? Did I tell the story? The, the vice, the, this, is a true, this is a true story. The vice president's office is really quite nice. Uh, Mr. Cheney liked it. Mr. Gore liked that I was with Mr. Gore, not Mr. Cheney. And, and they, had a, they had a nice time in the office. And, and I think Vice President Biden would have liked a, a, a little different office, a little bigger office, perhaps. If he was here, I would say this. Because in the Senate, he had a different, bigger office. It was very nice. And, um, but he had a fireplace. And it was 60 degrees outside. We had that fireplace cranking. And uh, for those of you who can see that I'm sweating now, I had a lovely chat with the vice president in front of the fireplace. He figured the fact that my cancer treatment was finished probably qualified me to go on to the next experience. So uh, I didn't know if that were, was true or not. But we had a nice chat. And he kept saying, oh, you're going to be the CEO of this outfit. He still says that. Says that. You're going to be the CEO. I said, no, no, no. I said, you haven't read Steve Goldsmith's book. And Bill Egger's book. Bill is here. Where is Bill? Bill? Bill's in the back. Steve and Bill explained that you don't, that hierarchy is not, that's not the way you did. It's, uh, it's not, it's very, it, networks. I said, well, uh, uh, Mr. Vice President, I'm going to be the coordinator. I'm going to coordinate. Yeah, you're the CEO. Right. Okay, here we go. So we had a nice chat about that, and I ended up being in charge of recovery implementation, the recovery implementation office. The thing I missed, thank God, was the single worst acronym ever created in government. Because I could have been the head of the Recovery and Transparency Board, <laughs> otherwise known as the RAT Board. <laughs> now, for those of you who are in government, you know the importance of acronyms. And being part of the RAT Board is not a good thing. So I ended up handling the recovery and implementation process. And I realized that as we did this, we had to think about the nature of innovation. I currently have a very large staff, including myself, of four people. That's it. We have a couple of detailees. Presidential management intern just showed up the other day. They're not called the management fellow. They're not called that anymore. And I said, how can we innovate? What are the drivers that will help me to influence the nature of innovation? And the first thing I figured out when I thought about it was one, individual spirit and insight. Those are the first four words. Individual spirit and insight. You gotta wanna innovate. It can't be something you tell, sorry, excuse me, uh, Tony, would you please innovate? Would you go out and go out of the back lot and innovate for a while, please? Pat, Patrick, would you go innovate? You can't do that. It's gotta come from inside. The driver has to be internal. It has to be something you wanna do that you do it for a particular reason that meets some kind of need that's internal to you. And that's exciting. That's an exciting moment when you realize the nature of your own spirit, of your own insight, of the things that you want to do. Gee, you know what? 
maybe if we did this and that, and we moved this to over here, and we took this, and we got the, and if somebody has a website, and we could, and all of a sudden, innovation occurs because you had the insight along the way. You had the motivation to do it. Second thing that is a driver for innovation is scarcity. Well, what do you mean scarcity? Well, if you got a lot of money and you got a lot of people and nobody particularly cares how you spend it, why bother being innovative? You're driving a 1958 Cadillac Fleetwood Coupe de Ville. Get six miles a gallon. <laughs> that is your government vehicle. It's a hell of a deal. It's not a Prius. The Prius is innovative. The Prius is based on scarcity. So you got to have scarcity. I'm a believer that unless there is a threat, unless there is an impetus to make that change through some kind of scarcity, you also have to have complexity. Innovation is based on going from complexity to simplicity. It takes the interpretation of those things that are hard and finds a way to make it easy. There was reference earlier to the Idaho folks. I spend a good deal of time in Idaho, not as much as I would dearly like. I spend time fishing on Silver Creek which is the single most beautiful trout stream in the whole universe. I haven't been on Mars, haven't been on Venus, but if they've got a better trout stream than Silver Creek, I want to hear about it. But water is the issue. Water is the complex issue throughout the West. How does it flow? Where does it come from? Where does it go to? Who owns it? How do they deal with it? So the innovation in evaporation in thinking through what does it mean to have water act in this way is an incredibly enlightening feature in the western United States. And as long as you don't evaporate Silver Creek, I'll be for you the whole time. <laughs> There's another trout fisherman in the back of the room. Mission orientation. I'm only about four words away. Mission orientation. Being driven by your mission. Uh, for years and years, I started working in government in 1968. I was in California, I was in Fresno, California, and I worked in a tiny little community services district in Delray, California, of all places. Um, and I then worked in Fresno for a while. And I always knew what it was that I was supposed to do what my mission was. And I listened carefully to the people who told me what my mission was. It was only when I became skeptical or uncomfortable about my mission that I thought that innovation was necessary. If I didn't have scarcity, if I didn't have complexity, if things were simple, if times were good, if my mission were easy, I'd need innovation. Didn't need it at all. I could just simply keep going with the flow. And that would have been a lot of fun, and would have been very quiet. But that's not the way it worked, because I had, as I spoke earlier, kind of the personal insight and the thought and I spirit and idea that maybe we could take these complex things and make them a little better somehow. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Final three words. Because it was cool. <laughs> if nothing else, Innovation is way cool. And you, ladies and gentlemen here tonight, are innovators, and as a result, you're way cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. You, uh we wanted you to speak about innovation, but really probably most people want to know where they can get more stimulus money. <laughs> no? Not in your pocket or anything? No, I'd be happy to tell you where to get more stimulus money. It's not a problem. Uh, www.recovery.com. <laughs> <laughs> and you look for various programs. And uh, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you need food stamps, you need food stamps. 
ham, you get your ham, no problem. So, Steve, whatever they need. Yeah, thanks for the inside tip. <laughs> thanks very much for your comments. Ed, Ed has occupied a number of, of uh, federal and local positions to give some insight on these important issues. appreciate your comments. Um, I'm worried about your knee, though. I'm fine. Okay. Um, we uh, start this process annually and, as I mentioned, receive an enormous uh, number of highly competitive proposals and go through a very rigorous uh, peer review process, uh, taking us down to the 16 finalists that are represented tonight. And from that group, pick six winners. Uh, some of the folks that are in the finals group that aren't the winners uh, sometimes apply the next year and are picked then after their programs have a little bit more of um, experience that can be evaluated by the evaluators. So we are uh, very appreciative and impressed by all 16. Uh, I'm going to ask the representatives from each of the programs to stand when I call their name. Please hold your applause until I list all of them. The finalists for the 2009 Innovations American Government Awards are, are they allowed to stand? Yes. Okay. So I have a script. And they pretend I'm the director of the program, but Carr really is the director of the program. And if I deviate from the script, I get, I get uh, hammered. So I want to make sure I'm doing this right. So please stand when your name is announced. Uh, the Auto Insurance Fraud Task Force of the City of Lawrence, Massachusetts. Please stand. Uh, the Center for Economic Opportunity of the City of New York. Thank you. Child Welfare Reform in the State of Maine. Crisis and Access Line in the State of Georgia. Those are slow to stand. Okay. <laughs> Emerging Contaminant Program of the Department of Defense. Thank you. Neighborhood Place, Louisville, Kentucky. Online, Louisville has a great mayor. He was educated in Indiana. Still a great mayor. As Ed said, I try to pay attention to the mayors. Online inmate, online inmate information in jail, visit reservation system of Santa Clara County, California. Thank you. Primary access network of Orange County, Florida. Thanks very much. Residential abandoned property program, city of Chula Vista, California. Standing in the back. And uh, video service delivery of the Social Security Administration. Please give all of them a, a round of applause. Um, the, uh, I, I, I'm sure uh, Bill Klinger and uh, Kathleen would agree with me. This, this year's um, award group, the competition and the, and the level of innovation was, uh, I think, among the best in the last 10 years. We had a really strong group of highly creative programs um, that, that provide some kind of fascinating examples. Now let's meet the winners. Uh, to just describe them in words doesn't quite work, so we've asked Bill Mosier, who helps us every year, to put together a a, a video presentation that he uses for the P PBS program called The Visionaries. He's been profiling our award winners for uh, several seasons now for his uh, television show. This is the geospatial technology section at the Idaho Department of Water Resources. We process satellite images and make digital maps. Wait in the water. Wait in the water. The maps we're making today are not your grandpa's maps. We're processing satellite images to see how much water is used on individual fields. Here in Idaho, Water is truly the lifeblood of our economy. We have about 3.3 million irrigated acres. Most of the western United States is a desert area, so that our precipitation, even over the entire year, is generally insufficient. Water rights have been a major issue in Idaho since the 1800s when, when the first irrigators began to divert from the various rivers. So we have what we call the prior appropriation doctrine. First in time is first in right. The system that we're using now in Idaho is called metric. The satellite is a lot like a color camera, except that instead of mixing the colors together, it actually takes separate pictures over six different parts of the solar spectrum. 
this is the raw Landsat data. The bright red areas show actively growing vegetation. And then this data is processed with the metric models and is converted into evapotranspiration or water consumption. And here we're, we can start to see the individual fields. And we can even zoom in a little further than that. And here we can actually see the individual pixels. These are 30 by 30 meters in size. Only metric can tell us how much water is actually being used on a field-by-field -field basis. And it is on a field-by-field -field basis that water rights are administered. What, one of the most important applications, in my mind, of the satellite-based evapotranspiration is to help sustain some of the global uh, water supply and food production. And our hope is that long-term, we should see millions, tens of millions of people uh, with a better food supply. Massachusetts Health Connector is a public-private partnership that has kicked off two rather um, significant programs. Hello, I'm Dr. Good. How are you doing? Nice to meet you as well. One for people who buy on their own, small businesses or individuals. So we're kind of certifying that those plans are, um, are good, solid plans that um, people can purchase and that the plans will cover them when they truly need it and one for folks who are low income, don't have access to other subsidies and need government help. I had health insurance uh, through my employers. I started getting sick and I uh, missed a lot of work and eventually lost my job because I was hospitalized for so long. Um, and when I lost my job, I lost my health insurance. What we had before was more of an episodic care where patients would come in, establish a relationship, they would lose coverage or lose their position at work and then not be able to come back or not be able to afford their medications. A lot of these folks were going uninsured. I have a chronic autoimmune disease called Wegener's granulomatosis. With the Universal Health Care Plan in Massachusetts, they now have more broadened access to care and they're now better able to access preventative services. The key thing is that they were not hooked into primary care and so they couldn't um, have the peace of mind of having regular health insurance coverage and being able to take um, issues before they become really big issues. We um, cover about 180,000 Bay Staters who really have no other way to get health insurance and are low income. Essentially the same as someone who had, you know, private insurance, um, but the premium is is very inexpensive. Uh, we've gotten all but about two and a half percent of Massachusetts residents insured. It's made such a huge difference in my life um, and in the lives of a lot of people. I am able to practice as a doctor. I'm really able to focus on a patient, focus on their disease, and improve their clinical outcomes in the end. It's essentially saved my life. We are trying to make government available and accessible, and the best way to do it, we think, is to have data readily available for the citizens of the District of Columbia. This is a citywide data warehouse program. This is where we collect all the data in the city, bring it to one centralized location, one of the really unique things about the citywide data warehouse is that it is in fact accessible to the public. We get that raw data out to the public and the mayor's office, and then we customize that data and put it out into simple charts and graphs so uh, everybody can understand it. Let me show you an example of an application that we create. It's actually a way for developers who are thinking about investing. I can simply tap on this car here. I can get a neighborhood profile, which shows me pictures of what the, what the place might look like. It shows me a map, perhaps. Now I want to see what retail sites are available. It zooms in. I can say, I'm interested in 600 F Street. That probably looks interesting. Give me a little bit more information. And right away, I have description of it. I have which ward it's in, available square feet, availability. Oh, I see it's available immediately. What's a picture look like? Now I can actually see already, this might be a place I want to invest in. So this is really just one example of an application we've been able to build with our data feeds. Making the data directly available as data, suddenly citizens are able to do more things with it. They can actually build applications with it. The next group of people, which was us, kind of the innovator, developer, you know, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. they, okay, let's do our part and kind of pull it together. The current focus is efforts on just putting the data out there and allows people like us to build services on top of it. It makes the data a lot more meaningful to citizens. They can actually use something like that. that. You might be interested to know what supermarkets are near you, or what the crime is like in your area, or what the demographics are like in your area. 
Well, with iLiveAd, you can actually get all of that information directly available simply by typing in your address. Essentially, a, a quick report of everything going on in your area. Rather than having to go and look at what the restaurants are in your area, where's the closest grocery store, what's the metro, what's the public transportation like, it just tells you all that all in one click. If you look at inventors, academics, people in government, you find a lot of the greatest achievements aren't driven by money. It's you, People want to solve problems. The central idea for new leaders is that a principal or school leader is a critical lever to drive student achievement outcomes for children. The principal is important because they're the ones who create the environment for all of the things that we know can be possible in schools that are really working for children. How do you recruit, select, train, and provide ongoing support to school leaders in order to ensure success. A candidate for new leaders for your schools begins with the intensive selection process. I felt that that was the most rigorous application I had ever filled out because it made me think about the commitment that I was going to make by applying to a new leader. We're looking for people who have, first and foremost, belief that all children can achieve at high levels. For sure, the ability to get other people to work together effectively at a shared vision the one thing that I would say had to be there was absolute courage. It starts with four weeks of courses where they come together from the city where they're going to be training with all of our other new leaders from across the country. It is a phenomenal uh, intensive training program. Uh, the, the single thing that I get the most from in foundations was the fact that I'm not alone, that there is a mass of school leaders out there who have the same vision as I do, that see schools as a place of uh, civil, civil rights action, a place of social change. Chicago, but I have made long life relationships and uh, it's exciting to be around so much wealth of knowledge and experiences that you, that you know that when you meet them, you could go and tap them. From there, they go into what really then puts all of that learning into practice. They go back to what we call their residency experience. So in the city in which they're training, if they're a resident selected for the Chicago Public Schools, They'll go spend the whole rest of the year in an existing urban public school working with a host principal there and they'll have the opportunity to actually lead a team of teachers. When I get back to Chicago to my residency, I'm charged, I'm going to learn and to apply everything that I have learned at Foundations. Now New Leaders has close to 700 leaders in this country leading um, close to 300 schools and our new leaders definitely feel like they are a part of a movement to drive education reform for each and every child at a scale across the country. Dr. Locke, how did this collaboration get started with Educate and Grow and Kingsport? As we're here today celebrating the grand opening of the highways, we realized here in the region that we had a problem. We were facing serious problems with our manufacturing sector. Kingsport was a manufacturing town, and we had lost thousands of jobs, and, and the people really didn't know where to turn. I called 80 business leaders together to participate in an economic planning summit. As uh, manufacturers, uh, we've got to have a workforce that is uh, modern, is trained, is efficient, is aggressive. And we really want to provide a means for local folks to get the, the technical training and knowledge that they need to do these uh, very high-skilled, challenging, very rewarding jobs. Determine the best way to attack the economic development problem and the job problem was to focus on education. We took the proposal to the Kingsport City Board of Mayor and Alderman, and they appropriated $50,000 to provide scholarship to you. Any student that graduates from high school can get a scholarship. So the city put up the money. In return for that, the college agreed to put a, a, a branch in downtown Kingsport. What better way to do it than to put your higher education center there? You, and, and what happens with it are all the spin-offs, the restaurants, uh, the housing that occurred. And we knew that by bringing more people into the downtown sector, you create the environment under which small businesses and others can survive economically. The academic village really helped in terms of even in its talking stages because uh, that helped people have confidence that they could invest in downtown. A citizen who lives here in Kingsport and started and completed an associate degree program in Northeast State 
And then without leaving the community and began their studies for a baccalaureate degree program, a master's or doctorate degree program in select areas. Dreams do come true, don't they? is a unique system of care that was created about 15 years ago to better serve children in this community with serious emotional and mental health needs. We're in order to the uh, Greenlee family right now, a family that uh, came to us on some really kind of difficult situations. I lost my second oldest son in 2005. He got accidentally shot at the age of 15. Well, Taurus was involved in the accidental shooting of his older brother, which left uh, all the family members, all the kids in the house, um, spread out in different placements. He lived for four days. And it kind of went, I kind of lost it. Yvonne was homeless at the time, without a job, without any of her kids in custody. And that's when Wraparound came in to, into my life. A key role in Wraparound Milwaukee is our care coordinators. A care coordinator is a person that works with the family team, but we're advocates for the family, and we work for the family. So we want to make sure that we're identifying the supports within the community that can help make that family be self-sustaining. Her brought me in as a uh, crisis stabilizer for Taurus, and I've just been working with him, trying to make sure that he stays in a positive, positive environment. It's more about, do you care about kids and families? And do you hold to the philosophy and values of wraparound? Those key principles of being family-centered, strength-based. It really can change lives. So, yes, it's gonna be, it's gonna be all right. Yes. With a moon and stars, quakes a snatch of faith in a calm um, And I'm gonna, we're going to do uh, is I'm going to um, announce the program and start to read about it, and then ask the. Uh, that program to kind of approach up here and then uh, Tony Sage will uh, present the award. So if I can invite Tony up here and uh, we'll take a very quick picture, right? And we'll, okay. And will somebody give Tony the, uh, the plaques? Oh, no. All right, okay. Thank you. <laughs> there's a narrative here, but there's no name of the program. Uh, this program, uh, the first program is uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Data Feeds. This program is designed to increase uh, civic participation, government accountability, and transparency in government practices. This is the first initiative in the country that makes virtually all current government operational data available to the public in its raw form rather than in a static edited reports. Raw data from multiple DC government agencies is housed in the city's. <laughs> I'm well lit. Yes. <laughs> you went very blue. Yes, well. The gentlemen, they're supposed to be listening to me, please. You told us we should have fun. Uh, yes. Yeah, right. Fun over here. All right. Well, that. Yeah. Okay. I'm worried about your. Uh, you might yeah. want to get rid of the. Okay. We we'll turn off the. Yeah, well, I'll just hold this. For we turn off the uh, yeah, camera, good. good. All right. Uh, as I was saying, raw data from the multiple DC government agencies is housed in the district's citywide data warehouse is supplied via 320 data feeds to online sites, citizens and government agencies to increase civic awareness. It's truly a democratization of government information. The initiative has lessened the burden on city infrastructure and increased government accountability to its citizens. The Innovations Award in Urban Policy 
which is our primary urban policy award this year, goes to the District of Columbia's Data Feeds Democratization of Government Data Program. Accepting the award is Chris Wiley, Interim Chief Technology Officer, and Dave Strigel, Program Manager. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right, next up is uh, Massachusetts. As the nation explores ways to expand access and reduce costs to health care, our next award winner is a key focus in the national debate. This independent state authority increases the pool of citizens with health insurance in Massachusetts, a central mandate of the state's health reform law of 2006. Since this public-private hybrid entity's inception, the state's uninsured rate has dropped from 10.4% to 2.6%. Uh, this innovation's award winner, Commonwealth Health Insurance Connector Authority. Accepting the award are the Executive Director of the Authority, John Kingsdale, and the Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer, Rosemary Day. <laughs> Next award, trout fishing in Idaho. <laughs> Next program addresses a topic that is fast becoming one of our nation's most important resource issues, water scarcity. Evapotranspiration is water evaporated from soil and transpired by vegetation. This program is the first in the nation to develop and use satellite-based imagery to enhance the understanding of agricultural water usage. The data collected is critical for settling water resource conflicts, for transferring water among users, including the environment, and especially important for improving agricultural water management. Now, you may have read about it in this morning's Washington Post. The Innovations Award goes to the state of Idaho's mapping evapotranspiration from satellites. Accepting the award is Tony Morris, manager of the technology section, William Cramber, senior remote sensing analyst, both of the Idaho Department of Water Resources, along with Rick Allen of the University of Idaho. Congratulations. Leadership. The program attack attracts high caliber individuals from both academic and corporate sectors to lead historically underserved and unperforming urban schools. As one of the original partner districts, Chicago has played a critical role in the development and expansion of this initiative. Program outcomes include significantly higher graduation rates and dramatic student learning gains. The next Innovations Award winner, New Leaders for New Schools from Chicago Public School District, accepting the award is Chandra Bird Wright, principal of the Dunn Technology Academy, and John Schnur, chief executive and co founder of New Leaders for New Schools. Um, uh, hey, John, uh, while, you're, while you're up here, I, uh, come here a second. So, so he's. Um, this is the Innovations in Government Award winner, and this, and this is one of the first ones that's focused on this fascinating uh, collaborative between nonprofits and, and government. And um, John's totally unprepared, but I, I, he's been at the forefront of this effort across the country. And how about uh, 60 seconds of brilliant insights about the cooperative nature between you and the Chicago Public School System? Who else would like to be invited up here for 60 seconds of brilliant insights? <laughs> um, I, I just want to um, was for thank Stephen Goldsmith and Harvard for this award in general in government and for the innovation of recognizing that one way to transform government is through nonprofit enterprises working closely with government to change government, share what's working across the country. New Leaders for New Schools is one example of that in partnership with Chicago Public Schools around education and kids in poverty achieving at high levels. But I hope it's a wave of the future for the award. And just thank you so much to Harvard and to our team and my wife, who is nine months pregnant and who stopped by tonight. Uh, we're going to leave if she has labor pains, I promise. <laughs> but thank you, Stephen. John told me that. Um, since she was due today, he may not actually be here, but maybe it's nine months. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's one day short. So thanks for being with us. Uh, next award winner, I'm going to invite uh, Patrick McCarthy from the Annie Casey uh, Foundation. And let me say just a comment about uh, Patrick and then introduce the award winner. Annie Casey uh, has had as a principal mission uh, its uh, commitment to children, particularly children in need of services. When I was mayor of Minneapolis, 
Andy Casey was a subject, a source of much of the venture capital that we use for innovation in our urban neighborhoods. And they've been at the forefront of both consulting about child welfare services uh, and, um, and leading the path to uh, very significant innovative results. They have sponsored the award that we're about to give. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, in a, it's in the area of kind of structural and systemic change in areas that affect uh, children. Uh, the next program and the winner of this award is Wraparound Milwaukee. Bruce would come up. This program offers a unique approach to care for at-risk youth. Uh, it is the first government-operated managed care service designed to treat emotionally disturbed children in the home setting. It reduces costly and ineffective, arguably ineffective residential care options by offering a host of individualized treatments to this is, this is almost impossible to describe in less than like four hours, but here's the way I get out of it, right? Bruce has worked everywhere in government. He's worked in mental health, he's worked for child welfare, he's worked for the county, and he looked at the inefficiencies in funding systems and said, look, if you guys would just forget your rules and give me a fixed amount of money, I'll make that money work better for children. And in, what's happened in wraparound Milwaukee is that residential placements are down, home placements are up, medical costs are down, juvenile detention placements are down, and the results are tremendous, and it's all due to the innovation of Bruce. Thank you very much. At least that's what I got out of it. Huh? Okay, all right. Uh, the next is... Uh, uh, Kingsport, Tennessee. Now, Mayor, you can bring some number of your constituents <laughs> here, but, but not all of them. We are, this is a really a, tr uh, a remarkably innovative um, program. And the, um, this award is uh, to a city which had an over-reliance on heavy manufacturing and faced a growing and aging population, shrinking youth workforce, dropping education levels of area residents, which threatened to further depress the region's standard of living. In order to reverse the impending economic crisis, the city launched a successful Educate and Grow campaign to attract new business investments to the region by upgrading the quality of the workforce. Since the initiative's implementation, the city reports a more diversified economy, increased sales tax revenues, property values that have increased, and additional investment. Families are returning to the area and educational levels are rising. The initiative has turned the city around. This, uh, uh, what impressed the judging panel is that this very complex initiative is broad-based community support involving a higher education, the K-12 system, the mayor's office, and, and a range of other um, actors and participants. So the Innovations Award to the Higher Education Initiative from the city of Kingsport, Tennessee, accepting the award is Morris Baker. Kingsport Grants and Government Relations Specialist William Locke, President of Northeast State Technical Community College, a key partner. Keith Wilson, publisher of the Kingport Times News. When I was mayor, the publisher never would have stood in the same podium with me, so congratulations <laughs> for being here. And last, and certainly not least, the Honorable Dennis Phillips, Mayor of Kingsport. Um, uh, uh, say, Mayor. Wait a minute. I think, I think it's a pretty good rule that all mayors and former mayors ought to have the right to speak. So John had 60 seconds, and you're a mayor, so could you take 75 to tell people what you did? Us mayors have to stick together. I agree with that. Um, let, let me first of all ask the Board of Mayor and Alderman who travel with us seven hours on the bus to come here, please stand. Let me express my appreciation to all of you. I'm sorry Kathleen Kennedy Townsend had to leave because my first introduction to politics was when her Uncle John ran for president and I'm from a little town in North Carolina called Newdale and there was two kind of people in Newdale, North Carolina. There was Democrats and those that, were going to, or those that weren't going to heaven. So uh, that was my first introduction. But let me just say on the, uh, what we've done in Keysport while it may be unique, it's not anything that any city cannot do. The two things you have to remember is that one, that 
it takes people before you to lay the groundwork and there'll be people there after you to continue what you have done. And let me say, you can accomplish so much if you're not concerned about who's gonna get the credit. And in Keysport, <laughs> thank you. I, I sincerely believe that, and in Keysport, we have had business, industry, public, private, all working together to make this happen. And, and the places we have visited have been so courteous to us that I would like to say that any of you want to know what we are doing in Kingsport, I hope we can be half as nice to you if you visit us as the people have been that we visited. And thanks to all of you, and especially thanks to the Harvard School of Business ICE Institute for recognizing what Kingsport, Tennessee has done. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mayor. We're uh, quite proud of our award winners this year. Um, a lot of attention will be paid to them over the next year. When I was, when I, when I was fortunate enough to win one of these awards uh, a while ago, we had uh, 5,000 visitors from around the world kind of visit in the next 18 months to kind of look at the innovation and, and test it out and tinker with it. So uh, uh, we hope that lots of folks will benefit from what you all have accomplished. So with that, um, we have a, we'll, t we'll begin to f uh, take uh, applications for the next round in January of this coming January, for those of you who'd like to apply again. And for those of you who would rather not apply but just have dinner, you're welcome to join us in the courtyard. Thank you to our award winners. One last round of applause for them. Just very, very quickly, um, I want to present this, Dennis. I had this entered into the congressional record today for the for the city of Kingsport, and just the innovation I mean, is a phenomenal award that the city got of 600 applicants, and uh, we entered this into the congressional record. And I want you to hopefully take that to your office and with with great pride to, to have to be able to to represent people like the folks in Kingsport. Thank I mean, it's you awesome. For what you do. And as a former mayor, I'm going to tell you, this guy right here, and yeah. <laughs> best know. job in the world, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for but, your friendship. But uh, a lot of people, a lot of people, okay. Dennis, make this happen. You, you were right about that. Not one person or two or three. And a lot of people had a vision. And I, I know as a mayor how hard it is and how tight dollars are. That was a brilliant thing you all did in Kingsport, Tennessee. I really mean that. And I, I, I tell you how I'm on the Education Labor Committee. And we're going, as you all, this huge health care debate that's going on now. And I say, you know, if you educate people, really the health care debate becomes secondary because they'll be able yeah. to provide for themselves. And what you've given in Kingsport is an opportunity for young people, people to go back to school, for whatever their phase of life is, and, and to be able to do that. And so, awesome job you all did. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, too. <laughs> Thanks a lot.